<laughs> I hope everything is on it. All right, so welcome back to Chopping It Up, man. Today we are speaking with Alyssa. And from what you summarized for me, we have drug addiction, we have sexual abuse, we have a young mother, but we have someone that has gotten past all that and gotten to the point that you are now. Yeah. And you wanted to come on and tell people, like, you can get through all that. It is okay, right? Yeah. Okay, so introduce yourself. Tell us, like, name, age, a little bit about you growing up, maybe. All right, so my name is Alyssa, uh, 32. I'm from Jefferson County. I currently reside in Berkeley County. Um, I have three children. Um, my oldest is 16 and a half, and my youngest is two. Okay. Um, and there's one in the middle there somewhere. I also have a grandson um, who's a year and a half. Um, growing up, for me, um, it was fun. It was fun, you know, but my stepdad was a alcoholic and there were some rages that I would intervene with as a young child with him and my mom. Um, there for a while, he went through a crack addiction and would go on weeks long binges. And um, my mom, she all worked, you know, she always worked. We were with my grandma a lot. Um, and it was just me and my brother. I have a little, a younger brother. So, um, I mean, growing up, that kind of stuff was normalized, you know, so, so to basically, speak. Right. So you thought it was normal when you were young just because that was all that you saw, right? Yeah. How about friends? Did you have friends that you went out and stayed at night with that didn't have that in the household? No, pretty much everybody that if I if I was around someone that that wasn't normal to them, then it felt uncomfortable for me. Hmm. So it was so normalized that it was uncomfortable to not see chaos. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, like, what what's he doing that's making you intervene? Is he beating on your mother? Is he hitting so her? So, they had gotten, I mean, it would get physical between both of them. Mm -hmm. um, they would, but a lot of times it was just them getting in each other's faces, you right. know? Well, of and course it, you want to protect your mom, right? Yes. Yeah, so I would always, even if it wasn't physical, if it was just verbal, but they would get in each other's face, I would always get between them and, like, shoving back the other way. And, you know, I was always closer to him growing up. I was always closer to him, but I always protected my mom. Hmm. So, like, you spent more time with him? Or, yeah, yeah. So you also felt like you could tell him, leave my mom alone? Yeah. Because yeah. you all were on that level. Yeah. Okay. So when did you start using? Where does drugs and stuff come in for you? So when I was 12, I snuck out um, and lied to my mom. I uh, went to a birthday party where I left with a friend of mine. Um, and we were walking, and we got picked up by these two guys. Um, they were going to give us a ride home. We never made it home. Uh, we crossed county lines, went into Berkeley County. We were raped numerous times over the course of, I think it was three days. Um, and finally we were managed to get away from there. Um, my aunt found us walking alongside the road, you know, a bunch of stuff come out of that. Um, he did end up getting some jail time out of that, but that's where the trauma kind of started for me. And after that, I never really felt like I fit in. You know, I was an outcast. Um, it was in the journal. Everybody talked about it mm. in school. Everybody knew about it. I was pulled out of public school. I was put on homebound at that point. Um, and so I, I lost all my friends. You know, I didn't have anybody. I didn't feel comfortable around guys. You know, not even my brother or my stepdad anymore. And so it put me in a really bad place. Um, and then I met my oldest daughter's dad. And he was like my security guard. He was older than me. He was bigger than me. He wasn't going to let anybody do anything to me. Um, and I stayed with him for a long time. I think we were together like 12 years. Um, and so through that, my addiction started. He had already had an addiction to Adderall, Ridland, that type of stuff. Um, and when he turned 18, he kind of just spiraled with it. And there, I was a mom at that point. I had my daughter at 15. Um, and I just wanted to fit in. I wanted to have friends. I wanted to be part of the crowd. And I found when I tried it that it took away all the bad stuff for a short time. Mm -hmm. You know, what did you like using? Heroin. Okay, straight to heroin? You didn't even start on pills or anything? I never right. tried pills until after I was on heroin. Okay. Yeah. What year are you saying this was? Um... I want to say 2011. 
Okay. So big difference in the drug market in the last 15 years. Though, oh, yeah. 13 yeah. years, whatever it is there. Yeah. So now it's like all fentanyl. Back then it was actual heroin. You actually got high and was high for several hours. Yeah. Right. Yeah, and it covered up. I mean, I didn't feel all that stuff. You know, I didn't have the fear. I was just felt like I was free, you know. Mm -hmm. I was just able to live a somewhat normal life, I felt like. Numbed all them crazy thoughts going on in your head. Yeah. Yeah, I think a lot of addictions definitely comes from trauma. I don't think we understand that enough that there's something happens before that usage. Yeah. Hmm. So, uh, I don't know how much you want to relive this part of it, but they take you away and keep you. Where do they keep you for several days? Like It was at his parents' house. So, who was this person? You Justin knew, Cook. And you knew him or didn't no. didn't know him at the time, but you know his name now. Mm -hmm. And what did he, what happened to him? He went to prison. Uh, I think he did like five years, two months, and he got out, and then he went back for a violation, and he o OD'd in jail and died. <laughs> so he only got five years for victimizing you and your friend. Yeah. How did you feel about that? It was a punch to the gut, really. Um a lot of it come down to the prosecuting attorney wouldn't push for the maximum sentence because I couldn't testify. I couldn't, I mean, I just, I couldn't face him mm -hmm. to testify. And so because of that, they just went off of the evidence they had pretty much from the hospital. Yeah, uh, everyone has a right to face their accuser. But in that specific situation, it puts you in an awkward place, doesn't it? Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. Okay. So from there, man, you start getting high, like numbing this pain. How long are you using heroin? So I used heroin off and on for about nine years. Really? Where are you getting it from? Uh, I was going to, from local, I've took trips to Baltimore you know, whatever I had to do. Mm -hmm. For seven years. So during the seven years, too, you, you obviously got your first child, right? Mm -hmm. And you said as a girl? Yeah. Okay, so yeah. what's where's she during this? Um, so I still lived at home with my mom. So pretty much through my addiction, she was with my parents. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So my parents practically raised her for at least half her life. I Into was there, but not mentally. Right. Right, because you're always chasing drugs. How about work? How are you getting money for the drugs? I did work. I did work. Um, I can't say I was ever terminated from a job for it. Um, I quit a couple. Um, Doing what kind of work? Mostly hotel work. Okay. Cleaning? Or, yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah, that was always kind of my thing. Um, mom, it was something my mom did, and I kind of just followed through. Um, and, I mean, I was good at what I did. You know, I didn't realize that at first, uh, took some pushing, but, and I really enjoyed it. Um, I just couldn't get away from the drugs. I could do a couple months here and there. I've tried maintenance, you know, things like that, but it was never long-term. Until what, what happened to change all that? So in 2016, I got caught in one of the largest kingpin drug busts in Berkeley County. Okay. Uh, with a big drug dealer. Um, I was originally charged with nine felonies. It was my first time ever really being in trouble. Um, I took a plea to that, down to, I think, two or three felonies. And um, I was sentenced to probation in the Berkeley County Day Report Center. Uh, it took me five years to complete the Day Report Center, which is typically about a year program. I uh, kept getting violated you know, or discharged because I couldn't keep it together. Um, I didn't follow anything that they suggested for me to do. Um, but my probation officer, you know, she continuously believed in me. And I fed this lady lines of shit. <laughs> um, but she continuously believed in me. And then there come a point in time where she said, I went in and she said this was in 2020. You know, so from 2016 to 2020, this just went on and on. I'd do a couple months in jail. I'd go to rehab. I'd get out. I'd be okay for a few months, and then it would start all over again. Um, in the mix of all that, I'd had my second child in 2018. Um, and 
So in 2020, she finally had me come in there and she just said, you know, I don't know what else to do to help you. You know, I've done everything I can do. Technical difficulties. So in 2020, she finally got the point across. Let's start right there. Yeah, she just said, you know, I don't I don't know what to do to help you. She said, and, you know, I, I don't quote, but something to the effect of, I refuse to allow you to die on my watch. Mm -hmm. You know, at this point, from 2016 to 2020, I've OD'd seven times. Um, five of those times, my mom gave me CPR um, until medics arrived. Um the last time that I had OD'd, so I'm backing up a little bit. This was in 2020. Um, I was my mom couldn't get me back, and I was taken to the hospital. And I remember waking up, and they've they've already like stuck tubes in me, and you know trying to get me to breathe on my own. And when I woke up, I seen this really really bright light, and I know it sounds crazy. People talk about it, but it's true. Um, and I I couldn't see, but I could hear. And my daughter, my oldest, was pretty much just begging God at that point to take me. Hmm. She was tired of seeing me like that. And you heard that. And I heard that. And that stuck with me. Um, and then right after, it was a few weeks later, I think, um, as when my PO told me, she said, you know, I, I don't know what else to do for you. You know, it's not working. So she arrested me. Okay, so we're going to start back at where she arrested you. First thing I want to ask you is during this 2016 to 2020, what are you doing that is getting you back into the drugs again? Um, men. Hmm. So drug using men. Yeah. Uh, okay. My oldest is dad and then my middle son's dad. I couldn't so get away from him. People, places, and things. Yeah. And I also had an ex in there, too, that was very abusive. Mm -hmm. You know, um, between the three of them, I've been shot at. I've been stabbed. I've been tried to catch on fire. I've had gasoline dumped on me, clothes ripped off of me in the middle of the street, pretty much left for dead. Um, so just enduring that stuff. And I kept that stuff a secret. I didn't share that with my family. You know, I wasn't open about that. So, you know, with all of those things that were going on, I kind of just shut down and continued using Okay, because I, I want to address the trauma and I want to address the things because this is where my brain goes is the trauma that you were went through when you were younger, whether it was, you know, sexual abuse or just physical abuse that kind of ties you to your relationships in some mm -hmm. way. So do you think you were seeking out this type of man that was similar to what you yeah. had seen growing up? Between that and, you know, and I've read a lot about this, too, is with the sexual abuse, um, you almost like and I like my my brain is reversed. You know, my mm -hmm. brain is seeking that, mm -hmm. you know, that's the abuse, the negativity, the sex, you know, the drugs, the things that I endured because of that is what I got so used to dealing with. You know, those are the feelings I felt for so long that if I felt any different, it wasn't normal. Um, and so it was almost like I was addicted to the abuse and, you know, the, the sex and the lies and the chaos and the cheating and the games and all the stuff that comes with it. As crazy as now that sounds. It sounds crazy, but it's, it does. I've definitely sees. I see more of that every time I do one of these because yeah. it's like, there's such a high to the opposite of the low. The low mm -hmm. is all this horrible, horrible, whatever, label it whatever, call it whatever. But then when it's, oh, hey, baby, I'm sorry. And like, you're so high from that. Yeah. That that's what you seek. And then it's almost like you cause a fight so that you can see that. And yeah. it's just up and down and up and down. Yeah. It's just like you're on a, you're in a, in a, you know, like a merry-go-round that you can't get off of. It's almost similar to heroin addiction, right? Yeah. Because, yeah. you, you know, I'm going to be high, and then I'm going to be sick, and then I'm going to be high, and then I'm going to be sick. Yeah. Crazy how our brains work. It is. It's crazy. So uh, I know, like, when you're abused in that way, you're obviously not going to uh, seek that type of sex. Do you think it made you hypersexual? Do you think it made you seek sex in a different way? Because I have talked to other girls that have been through similar things that say that made them hypersexual. Like they felt like they got 
validated through yeah. sex. Yeah, I mean, it was pretty much that. I never really went out seeking, like, random guys for sex because of the fear I still mm-hmm. had. Mm-hmm. But once I, I think I always had a fear of being rejected. Okay. So it was like, if you wanted it, then, you know, we mm. were going to be together and I was going to let you do it. Because, you know, like, I always had a fear of saying no. You know, even if I was in a relationship with this person and I, you know, was dead tired or did, I would just, I couldn't say no. So, I mean, it was almost consensual, but non-consensual because it was like I just felt like I, you know, I had this fear of saying no, which granted a lot of the guys I was with were very abusive. So it's an argument inside of your head in that moment. Yeah, that's crazy. So, and that's probably one of the reasons you had a child so young. Yeah. Hmm. Okay. So fast forward to 2020 and she says, I can't help you anymore. So. Yeah. So I was arrested um, and she filed a full revocation on me and I had five years over my head. Hmm. Um, So she filed a full revocation and I called my attorney. So I'd gotten a court date for February 17th to do the revocation and the sentencing. And I talked to my mom. And at this point, my youngest, which is now my middle, was two. And he was calling my mom, mom. And I was pissed at my mom at first. And I'm like, why are you letting him call you? And she's like, what do you want me to do? You know, what? and then she had told me her health wasn't the greatest. And she said, you know, I can't raise a child to show. I can't. And so then the only thoughts that went through my head was, um, he's going to have to go to the state because his dad was long gone, you know. And that pushed me to try something different. So I reached out to my attorney and I said, you know, can I please ask for a reconsideration? You know, I think this is it. And she said, you know, you're going in front of a hard judge. I'm not going to argue with her about it but if you know you want to ask for it we can certainly file for it um so we did that um and the judge granted it she granted me a year of home confinement in um instead of a year prison so Mm -hmm. you know technically if I I had a one to five I would have went to prison I would have seen pro after a year so I did that on an ankle monitor at home so I was on ankle monitor I seen you know, I went up for parole in front of her after my year, and she granted me parole. Um, so now, basically the year was like time served, yeah. but you got to serve it at home. On an ankle monitor. But, I mean, there were some stipulations to it right, also. Right, still with your kids, right? Yeah, I was right. with my kids. I did complete the day report center, <laughs> um, which was a huge accomplishment for me because it was something I tried to do for so long. Mm-hmm. And, you know, they believed in me. They, you know— I still associate with the peer recovery coaches there and, you know, they really pushed me and, you know, they seen something in me that I couldn't see in myself at the time. And um, so it was a big accomplishment for me to be able to complete that program. Do you think you was ready when they started pushing you or was you just doing it like, yo, I got to do this, stay out of trouble? Or was you ever doing it because like, I'm tired of this life? So back in 2016, it was more of just to get out of it. Mm -hmm. Um, But in 2020, I finally, I had been trying to work a program prior to that, like a 12-step program. And so I'd gotten the hang of it. Um, I did the CCAR training for peer recovery coach. I'm a certified peer recovery coach. And, you know, that was prior to my last relapse. So I had a good bit of knowledge of Mm -hmm. what I I needed to do or what I should be doing. Um, So in 2020, it was finally, you know what, I I need to do this. You know, I'm sick and tired of, of this life. I'm tired of being locked up. I'm tired of being away from my kids. You know, um, their dads aren't going to do it. So, you know, I'm going to have to. Um, and from that, I just, I pushed myself. And when I got out, the same day I got out, I went I went to a meeting. You know, and that's the program I work today is a 12-step program. I have mm-hmm. a sponsor who has a sponsor who has a sponsor. Mm-hmm. You know, I have sponsee sisters. We're like family. Um, you know, I go to meetings um, I don't care what they are, NAAA, CA, CDA, whatever. It all works the same for me. So you're completely abstinent from everything? Completely abstinent from everything. That's good. So you changed your habits, though, right? Like oh, the yeah. biggest part of what you did was you didn't come home the last time. 
and go back to the guys, go back to the dope houses, go back to the same habits. Yeah. And so take me through like a day of yours right now. Like how much of your day is spent towards focusing on recovery? Like, do you still have to focus on it every so, day? I mean, it is, it is. I mean, it's number one without it. I don't have anything else, mm -hmm. you know, um, I've learned that. Um, but today it's a lot simpler. You know, it's not as complicated because as addicts, we tend to complicate things. Right, well, you're four years removed. Um, so, so after four years, you, you kind of. Right now, yeah, I had 42 months on the 28th. So um, now, though, when I get up in the morning, you know, I send gratitude lists out. Three things I'm grateful for every day. Um, to, you know, my sponsees or, you know, people that have asked, hey, you want to be part of the group? Send gratitude lists. Um and I try at some point throughout my day, it can be chaotic, but I try to do at least one reading. Um, that was a suggestion from my sponsor at one point. Um, and it's nothing in particular. It has to be just pick a book, mm -hmm. you know, just do a daily reading. Um, and sometimes I just reflect for myself on that, of what that looks like for me, you know, in my life today. Uh, my days can be really chaotic now. I mean, I have three kids, a grandson. Mm -hmm. I have a house, you know, to keep up with. I have a full-time job. So, you know, it can, it can get chaotic, but it's a good chaotic. Right. You know, I always joke, I say I live for the chaos, you know, but today it's totally different than what it used to be. So with all that busyness, how much downtime do you get? How much time do you have to watch TV and do nothing? Not a lot. <laughs> but um, my kids are on a pretty structured schedule. So, like, my youngest, she's in bed at 7 pretty much every night. And then my middle, he's usually in his room about eight watching TV. So, you know, I have a little bit of time there in the mm -hmm. evening with mm -hmm. my significant other or just by myself. Right, you right. Know? So I do at least try to take a day every couple of weeks for me, whether it's just getting my nails done or, you know, whatever mm -hmm. that looks like um, for self-care. Mm -hmm. um, and I do have family that show up for me now and help mm -hmm. with my kids. You know, hey, we want a weekend away. Have them keep the kid. You know, it's nothing now to be able to ask that because they trust me and know that. I'm doing what I say I'm going to do. How long do you think it took you to build that trust back up? Cool. With my mom, <laughs> probably at least two years. It's hard. Yeah. It's hard, man. I think people can't expect to just come out of jail, come out of these habits for a couple of years and just be like, I've been clean for three days. You're supposed to trust me. It's not yeah. how it works. Well, I hear that a lot. Right. I hear it a lot, you know, and I, I volunteer my time to speak at the local rehab in Kearneysville and, mm -hmm. and um, you know, I've shared many a times at our local meetings in Martinsburg and, you know, show up to the recovery events and, you know, talk to newcomers and, you know, let them know what it's all about and what it took me. So two things with that. Number one, do you think that sharing helps you and do you think that helping other people helps you? Both. Both. So sharing helps me um, because it reminds me I'm not alone. You know, when I share, I get so much feedback. Um, of people who've been through similar things or currently going through similar things or, you know, um, and that, you know, for so long, I just thought I was so alone, you know, there was nobody else like me, mm -hmm. you know, I was different. You're not the first person to say that from that chair. And so it, it's a good feeling to know that there's a lot of people out there like me. You know, and I, I'm never alone today. You know, I have plenty of people I can reach out to. And my higher power is my number one. You know, I can always, I never, like sitting here today, I'm never, I don't have to be alone. You know, there's no reason for me to feel alone. Um, and when it comes to helping other people, it's just like, I try to be for them the person that I once needed. You know, that's mm -hmm. my goal. When someone asks me for help or, you know, reaches out to me, Sometimes I have to pray about it. Sometimes I call my sponsor, you know, whatever it looks like for the situation at hand. But I just want to be the person for them that I once needed mm -hmm. um, in my life. You know, I don't think I'll ever match who my sponsor is. She's an amazing lady. But I strive to do better, you know. In order to lead, you have to learn how to follow. Yeah. Yeah, so learn how to follow and do what she's doing, and then you can pass that down and— you know, you'll be the amazing sponsor to somebody else, right? Yeah. Yeah, I think we got to stay focused on it, man. And little things like that uh, definitely help. 
like I'm reminded every day of how much I'm happy to be away from that life. Yeah. I got pains, aches and pains every day that I know <laughs> a Vicodin or a Percocet or something would take care of, but it's just not for me, man. It doesn't do the same things it used to do. Yeah. And once you get out here, I was just talking to a buddy of mine earlier that recently quit gabapentin and he, he was talking about how I was telling him when I'd quit that like you just, you're high on life. There's like this whole new energy to life. You know what I mean? Do you feel like that kind of started happening when you got clean too? Like you oh, start yeah. getting a high off of other things. Oh yeah. I mean, one of the biggest things for me is seeing my kids happy, you know, seeing their faces mm -hmm. light up or my oldest daughter wanting to come live with me um, or, you know, trusting that she can come to me and talk to me about personal things. You know, when she found out she was pregnant, I was the first person she wanted to tell, you know, that meant a lot to me. Um, you know, when she went in to have the baby, she wanted me there. Um, you know, things like that today, it's like, man, it's a feeling that I've never felt before. You know, I never knew what the true joy and freedom was until I see it through my kids. Um, and I mean, there's a lot of other things in my life that bring me joy too. Mm -hmm. you know, having, having a house to clean, you know, I gripe about it sometimes complain, but I didn't always have my own house to clean. You know, I didn't always have a good man to make dinner for. Um, you know, I, I didn't always have the energy or the motivation to clean up, to pick up after my kids or to do daily things with my kids. You know, now it's nothing for me to go sit out back and swim in the pool with them or, you know, take them for a walk or, you know, I mean, and I still... And you enjoy doing it. It's not a job. Yeah, it's, it's something that I truly enjoy doing mm -hmm. today. And that's something I strive for the most, I think, when I did get finally say this is enough I have I've got to do this um one thing I've always been really adamant about was being a mom I want it to be like I just want it to be able to be a good mom you know and today you know there's still days I question myself I doubt myself but looking through the past couple of years like I know I'm a good mom you know I'm the one that my kids run to you know my kids look up to me um and I can be there for them. I show up for them today. You know, my oldest... Clean, straight. Unfortunately, had to endure the pain and the brunt end of it. Um, yeah, mine too. But it's made her stronger too, you know, and it's brought us closer. There's a lot of things that she knows about me that other people don't know, you know, that I've been able to share with her. So, I mean, just having those relationships with my kids mean everything to me. Hmm. Yeah, man. So how about like, uh, how about seeing others overdose? Have you ever watched somebody else overdose? Have you ever overdosed yourself? Oh, yeah. Well, um, we talked about you overdosing. Yeah, I've overdosed seven times. Um, I carry and Narcan could, with me right, now. Right, so that's another thing I was going to ask, too. As a, Like, I have a couple in the truck and a couple in the tattoo shop that I was given, and I just have them for just in cases. Yeah, I have them in my car, and my boyfriend has them in his car. We have them in our house. He's actually a trainer, so he typically has a good bit of them. Okay. And um, I've never had to use it being sober on someone. Mm -hmm. um, but when I was using, there was somebody that OD'd in the back of our car going down 81. And I jumped over the seat and started giving him CPR. And at that time, I didn't carry Narcan. Um, and my ex at the time, he was like, we're just going to drop him off. I was like, we can't. We can't do that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, I'm not going to jail. Um and I was able to give him chest compressions and, you know, bring him back. And it was a big mess. I mean, his girlfriend was messed up and thought I robbed him and was trying to kiss him and all kinds of stuff. But he did come back. You know, I've never had to physically see someone pass from it. But a lot of people from my past have not not been so lucky, you know. Right. Um, the girl that was with me when I got raped, we were childhood best friends on up. You know, we had lost touch, but we still would reach out, you know, check on each other. She passed away last November, this past November from an OD, and she had been doing good. She moved away. She had gotten sober, and her boyfriend found her on the bathroom floor. Fentanyl. That was really hard for me um, to endure because we had lost touch, and it's kind of like you go through the guilt of, I wish I would have done more. I wish I would have reached out more. You know, I wish I would have tried to— you know, make check on her more, you know, things, you know, the whole what ifs 
Um, Especially when you had those thoughts right around the time that they go. Huh? Yeah. Yeah. So unfortunately, I mean, that wasn't the case, but I know that prior to that, she she had a good bit of a happy life with where she was at. So. Yeah, uh, the older we get, you know, it's like a curse and a blessing at the same time, right? You get yeah. to see some things get better and some things grow, but you also have to watch things die. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, being sober and, you know, working a program that I work and stuff, it's like you just want to reach out and save them. Yeah. You know, and... When you get to this side, man, you want everybody to be here. Yeah. And you don't I mean, want none of those people to stay over there feeling that way. Yeah, and I deal with that with, you know, like... My oldest his dad is still out there and, mm -hmm. you know, his sister and that I was once really close with. And it's like, you know, having to cut those ties and, you know, only being able to reach out to help. And it's so hard, you know, and I was telling their mom, I was like, I just want to be able to save them. Like I've offered help and obviously they're not ready, but I, I just want to be able to save them, um, you know, because there's so much stuff. You don't know what you're getting nowadays. And there's some stuff where it just takes literally like a pin drop mm -hmm. to, to kill you, you know. Or eat your skin off or cause some infection that you never get rid of. I mean, it's literally eating people's skin off I've, now, Yeah, man. I've seen that. Yeah, it's we terrible. had a one of my mom's old friends' daughter passed away, I think, last year from that stuff. Had done like eight holes all through her muscle and her tissue. And, and just keep on going, man. It's yeah. terrible how strong that shit is. Yeah. Thankfully, I mean, the last thing that I did do was that boot. And that was a that was a trip and a half. Hmm. But, <laughs> um, I had a friend of mine got laced with that a while back. He yeah. was just smoking with somebody and, they, and he was tripped out for five or six hours. Oh, it it's, said it was horrible. It's bad. Hmm. It's bad, but it's almost like kind of like crack cocaine. Once you do it, you want more. Um, Even though it's a bad experience. Yeah, it's weird. That's it's crazy. Weird. Um, but it's almost like you don't want to feel coming the coming down part. So you got to do something to keep you up there. Um, but you don't want to feel like that either. So it was a really hard thing. Um, that was the last thing I did. But thankfully, other than that crazy, you know, chemical stuff, I didn't do get into all that other mm -hmm. crocodile and. Right, yeah. I think drugs started going really crazy five or six years ago with, yeah. with all that people flipping around on the, you know, we didn't do that. We just got so high we fell asleep in our laps. Yeah, yeah. And then the last two times I did OD, it was fentanyl. One time it was car fentanyl, the other time it was fentanyl. Hmm. How hard was that? Both times somebody, you had to go to the hospital? Yeah, so, well, the one time I think they Narcan me like five or six times. Right. Um, and then the last time was when I had to go to the hospital. I was out mm -hmm. of it for a pretty long time. Um, I ended up having CAT scans to make sure there was no brain damage and, mm. you know, from the lack of oxygen and things. Thankfully, there wasn't. But I pretty much knew at that point. Wake up call. I couldn't go on like that. Wake up call, man. You know, yeah. it was life or death for me at that point. Yeah, I think the same thing happened to me. I woke up from this fogginess, don't really remember much of it, but here I am in jail wondering what happened and trying to piece together the last couple of days and. You know, it's just so scary because it's like this time's gone and you yeah. were dead and like what happened? It, yeah, that's definitely something that needs to turn you around. If it doesn't, there's something really going on in it. Yeah, yeah. So if you had, uh, you know, just so we can wrap up, did we talk about everything you wanted to talk about? Was there any other points you wanted to make? No, I think I think that was it. Okay. And then if you had like a mission statement or, you know, something you could tell the world that you could wrap up into a nice little box what would that be um i think it would be just to remind people that it only takes the hope of a size of a mustard seed to start jelly roll i like that you know just take the first step mm -hmm. you know as long as you have breath in you it's never too late there's plenty of help around too, right? There is. There is. Like if you can't find an addict in this friggin' day and age that's gotten straight, you're not looking too hard. I yeah. can throw a fucking yeah. rock and hit several. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think the most important thing is just to let people know that as long as you take a step, you know, in the right direction, then there's hope for you, you know, as long as you're breathing. Yeah, for sure, man. But I'm with you. I understand the wanting to see those people do better, man. 
So keep spreading the word, you know, take some sponsors in. You, like you feel like you're at a point where, you know, you're separated enough you can help other people. That's kind of the next step in our process, right? Yeah, yeah. For sure. Yep. Well, awesome. I appreciate it. Yeah, man, I appreciate you coming down. I appreciate you making the time. Like I try to make appointments with some of the other people who've hit me up and they just <laughs> kind of disappear. So I like it when I can just hit you up and you're like, yeah, let's do it. You make an appointment and y'all make it. It's so awesome for me. Yeah, I can always fit something in my chaotic schedule. Right, right. <laughs> and you want to stay busy too, man. Like a part yeah. of my life in being clean is being busy. Yeah. I want to be busy all the time. Like I'm one thing to the next. I don't want to have any downtime where I'm just sitting there. Yeah. So, yeah. but yeah, thanks for coming, man. I'll let you get out of here, you know. Uh, how about social links or anything like that? Do you want to drop any Facebook page or uh, Snapchat? Yes, I or? have um, Facebook and it's under Alyssa Noel. Okay. Um, same as the name and the title i'll spell it the same way okay yeah and then i also have a uh, snapchat it's just under my email abagent91 at gmail.com okay so yeah man if y'all want to reach out to her say anything about her story that you know reached you or, or spoke to you in any way you know drop a comment she just told you where you can reach her if you want to message her herself and uh you know we'll see you for the next one so until the next time don't sweat the petty things pet the sweaty things <laughs>